So Oxford Personalised Medicine Society is very pleased to introduce Dr George Busby who will be speaking to us today on the implementation of genomic precision medicine with polygenic risk scores. So just as a reminder to those of you who haven't been to a Oxford Personalised Medicine Society event before, uh, we are a student society based at the University work with the Centre for Personalised Medicine and we act as a platform for students across colleges to develop their interests in personalised medicine through education and discussion and what this means in a practical sense is we hold regular talks from researchers um, and sometimes even from students so don't feel free to reach out if you'd like to speak to us as well as holding an annual symposium to highlight student involvement in personalised medicine research. Um, so George if you're there and you'd like to get started just let me know. Oh, George, I think you're muted still. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, okay, great. Thanks very much for the invitation. And yes, I'm going to today, today talk about implementing genomic precision medicine with polygenic risk scores. Um, and so as a brief overview of what, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the company that I started, Alelica, with a couple of um, friends of mine talk about why we started that, and then give a brief kind of introduction into what polygenic risk scores are, what their value and their clinical application is in, in two particular diseases, coronary artery disease and breast cancer. Now, I think that the clinical the argument for clinical application is, is there for a whole bunch of different diseases, but I'm gonna concentrate on those two for this talk. And then talk more generally about the potential benefits of using polygenic risk scores, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. So as this is the Oxford Personalised Medicine Society, I thought I'd give a bit of a brief background as to, to, to where I've come from, because I started a PhD in Oxford about 13 years ago now, and that was on human evolutionary genetics. And a lot of that work involved developing statistical genetic methods to try and understand uh, human history through the analysis of big genetic data. Um, Following that, I, I, I did a couple of postdocs at the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics where, uh, and at the Big Data Institute where I concentrated on um, for the population genetics of Africa. Uh, I worked as part of a big project called Malaria Gen. Um, there was a certain amount of malaria genomics done uh, 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 as part of that postdoc as well. And um, sort of the last bit of my time uh, at the BDI was spent on genomic surveillance. Now, there's a, you can see a picture of a Land Rover there. I was very lucky to get a, a grant from Land Rover to, to, to go across Africa in a Land Rover with some genetic sequencing machines to, to, to sequence mosquito and malaria parasite DNA. And that really gave me a real taste for the implementation and translation of genetics. And what do I mean by that? I mean, what we were really trying to do there was to take research. And in this case, we were taking uh, Oxford nanopore min-iron machines, which are these tiny machines that can produce genetic uh, data. And what we were really trying to do is to take them into the field and to try and get people to use the data to make policy decisions. And that was reasonably successful. There's a grant that came off the back of that that people are still working at in Oxford. It's led by a guy called Jason Hendry at the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics. And of course, everyone knows about genomic surveillance now because of, of COVID. That was, this, this particular project was pre-COVID and um, as I say, everyone knows about genomic surveillance now, and it, it, it's really helping those of us who want to translate genomics to, to really show the case for, uh, for, for, for using genomics to provide information that can, that, can, uh, that, that can really feed into policy and healthcare. So, so, so why, why did we start Alelica? Well, although I was enjoying my research at, at Oxford, um, I was beginning to get a bit impatient that a lot of the, the discoveries that we were seeing made around us were just being a bit, you know, were taking too, too long time to get implemented. And with my good friend Giordano Botta and uh, Paolo Di Domenico, we, we, we decided to start a company a few years ago uh, to really try and help accelerate this idea of using genomics in healthcare. And as I say, we wanted to translate genomic research into clinical practice and, uh, um, and uh, we realized quite quickly that there were a lot of problems with doing that. And this is why we started the company to try and solve some of these problems. One of the problems was that whilst there are very skilled bioinformaticians in research in institutes, actually in the, in the kind of, in the healthcare world, 
there's a real lack of skilled bioinformaticians. There's also a lack of really robust, strong computational infrastructure to do analysis at scale, analysis of genomes at scale. And although there are clear and, and very well-known examples of people using genetics uh, uh, in healthcare, there are no real disease-specific guidelines for using genomic information. And by that, I mean really deep uh, uh, genomic inf information. So information from across the genome, not just single mutation variants. So we all know about diseases like BRCA, uh, diseases like breast cancer, where genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 have, you know, have been implicated. They're very, very specific mutations. When you, when you try and think about polygenic risk or, or genomic information, there are no really specific guidelines for how to use that. And, and so we thought actually building a company to try and answer some of those questions and develop, develop the use case for that is a, is a really interesting challenge. And on top of that, um, there's what I'm going to call a lack of physician awareness. And what I mean by that is that the education around polygenic risk as opposed to monogenic risk, which I was just talking about, is, is quite low. So we really need to try and um, or want to try, if we want to try and translate genomics research into the clinic, then we have to try and start making clinicians and physicians aware of the power of genomic information. So the aims of our company are really to do three things. They're to translate many discoveries uh, 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 that we see in genomics research into the clinic uh, uh, and to enable the next generation of clinical genomics. And we're also very keen to try to set the industry standard and to be the premier provider of computational tools for polygenic risk score analysis and reporting. And by that, I mean building robust, uh, 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 standardized ways of generating genomic data, uh, of generating genomic data analyses at scale and in a robust reproducible way. So we do that by building software. So we're, 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 we're a technology company. We are, our main product is what's called a software as a service. This is a uh, modular pipeline that we've built and it enables anyone to develop a new polygenic risk score or to run a polygenic risk score on their own data. I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about what a polygenic risk score is in a minute, but I, I thought I'd start just by kind of setting out our soul of what we do. And so we're, we're a software company and our software helps support clinical genetics labs, health systems and, and researchers to, to run polygenic risk scores. And we've developed multiple different bioinformatics pipelines that can turn genetic data into reports. And again, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about what I mean by reports. But, but the, uh, another key information, uh, another key, key aspect of what we are trying to do is to not just think about a polygenic risk score and an individual as being the end of the process, but thinking about ways in which we can turn that into actionable information. So we want to make our pipelines as easy as possible to use. Um, and we also want to make them, as I say, robust and uh, and uh, to be able to run multiple different uh, algorithms in parallel. So we want to speed up the bioinformatic, bioinformatics pro uh, uh, process by, 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 by building this software that is very fast, very scalable, robust, and comprehensive. Um, and as I say, we're also very concerned and very interested in trying to explore and to develop ways in which we can integrate polygenic risk into other risk models and to report uh, the genetic component and other components of risk so that we can really try to push forward this agenda of, of genomic prevention or to, or to use genomics in, in preventative healthcare. And on top of that, we also do a bit of pure kind of what I'm going to call PRS research and development, but we do develop our own polygenic risk scores and try to publish papers as well. Um, so that's a very brief introduction into where I come from and, uh, and what the company's about. So what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is, is what polygenic risk scores are and, and how, they, how they're used in the clinic. So we've known for a while, thanks to uh, genome-wide association studies or GWAS, is that in many common diseases, rather than there being a few single variants that, that can uh, contribute to risk, there are actually quite a few relatively common variants spread across the genome that can contribute to, um, to an individual's uh, uh, risk of disease. And so the first start of developing a PRS is to get some, some summary statistics, which is a measure for a given set of variants across the genome 
uh, a measure of their effect on, on association with disease. So this, these come from the kind of classic case control studies where you have a bunch of people who are a case for a disease, a bunch of people who are a control for a disease who don't have the disease. You compare their genomes and try to find alleles that are more common in cases rather than controls or in controls rather than cases. And uh, what you get from these studies is, is what's called a beta, which is an effect size. So the effect of that allele on a disease and then some statistical test, some p-value that, 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 uh, that, that of the statistical support of that association. So these, these are what really feed into the generation of polygenic risk scores. And as I say, over the last 15 years, there are now hundreds if not thousands of genome-wide association studies that have been done on ever larger data sets really providing us the kind of raw material to be able to build polygenic risk scores. Now, once we have some summary statistics, in order to build a polygenic risk score, you need a new data set, which has uh, individuals with a disease of interest and individuals without. And on that validation data set, one can start to build a polygenic risk score. So there are various different algorithms that you can use, and there are more and more algorithms being published every year. And um, the first step of generating a polygenic risk score is to, is to, is to try, um, and in our case, we, we, we're very keen to not, uh, not um, support one particular algorithm, but to, 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 to try lots of different algorithm, algorithms to try and generate the best score. So different algorithms will work, diff will work better in different situations, and uh, uh, you can uh, test a bunch of different algorithms on a validation data set to understand which is the best, which is going to produce the best score. You then need to take that validated score and test it on a third data set now. Um, and uh, what that does then is to avoid a statistical concept called overfitting. So it ensures that the polygenic risk score that you've 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 validated on your validated on your validation data set is uh, it, it, it will work on a on a new data set. So you can see now that we're, you know, in order to build these things, you, you need you need a lot of data. <laughs> uh, and then at the end, the idea is to have a polygenic risk score pa panel, which is just simply a, a, a list of variants where there is evidence from the, from all the analysis that you've done up to this point of uh, of for a given set of variants, uh, what a risk allele is and what the effect that that risk allele has on your or on your disease of interest. And then once you've got this polygenic risk score uh, panel, in order to uh, apply that to individuals, you just add up the risk alleles that an individual has. So if you're thinking about generating a polygenic risk score for individual J here, all we would do is to sum up the uh, allele effect sizes for every allele that this individual carries um, by the number of risk alleles that they have at each variant. Um, and as you can see from the equation, what you need to do is to do it over M variants. Now, how do you decide what M variants are? Well, that, that goes back to the polygenic risk score development process and uh, various algorithms work in different ways. So a relatively straightforward way of building a polygenic risk score is just to take uh, genome-wide uh, uh, significant variants, p-value thresholds, so take only variants uh, below a certain p-value um, and then uh, prune out those to ensure that you're not uh, to, to, to ensure that you're removing uh, variants in, in LD. Uh, but then there are more, more and more increasingly sophisticated ways of handling linkage to equilibrium and other ways of pruning variants and adjusting and shrinking the betas of polygenic risk scores in various different ways. And I'm not going to talk in any more detail about these different algorithms, on, algorithms only to say that there are multiple algorithms. algorithms and again, it's important to, to highlight the fact that when developing a polygenic risk score, you should really try as many different algorithms as you can to ensure that you find the one that is best suited to the data. Um, so as I hinted to a bit earlier, uh, polygenic risk scores are, are based on, on common variations. So if you think about a continuum of human disease, you could think about um, diseases where rare variants that have quite large effects uh, and are quite well known um, uh, can cause disease. So. A, a very well-known example of this uh, uh, mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 that cause, that, that really, really increase your risk of breast cancer. Incidentally, they don't mean that you're definitely going to get breast cancer, they just heighten your risk. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back onto that later. But the kind of traditional view of how genetics, uh, and, and in particular clinical genetics works, is that you know we understand, we, we try and identify whether or not an individual carries one of these very rare variants. If so, 
their, their risk of disease is massively increased. Um, but actually, uh, what we understand now from, from, from genome-wide association studies is that there, there are other diseases where many, many common variants, each of which has a small effect, can influence an individual's risk of disease. And these are the sorts of diseases where polygenic risk scores can really come into the fore. And the nice thing about polygenic risk scores uh, in, in, in certain diseases is that they're normally distributed and they can predict risk. So what do I mean about that? So if you here run a polygenic risk score for coronary artery disease on the UK Biobank, you will find this nice normal distribution of scores where some people have high scores up in the, the right hand end of this, this plot and some people have low scores, but most people have a score in the middle. And as I say, this is just, um, uh, we find that we find this because uh, people, uh, because, because these variants are common, okay? And some people have more of the common variants with more of the risk than others. And you get this nice distribution, uh, this nice normal distribution of, of risk, of, of, of polygenic risk scores. So then when you look at those uh, at individuals in that distribution and look at the prevalence of, in this case, coronary artery disease, we know that the average, the average prevalence in the UK biobank bio of coronary artery disease is about uh, three, three and a half percent. When you split that distribution into percentiles, a distribution on the left into percentiles, and uh, and compute the the prevalence of CAD in each of those percentiles, you get this nice distribution where people with the highest polygenic risk scores for CAD, uh, th there tends to be more more CAD in those groups, and individuals in the lower percentiles, so people who've got lower polygenic risk scores, uh, risk scores, there's there's a there's a lower prevalence of CAD. So what these scores are doing are picking up risk and indeed are able to predict risk. So now I'm going to talk about my first example of, of where we think PRS can be used in the clinic and that's in, in, in coronary artery disease. So remember the process of, of, of generating a polygenic risk score, you require summary statistics, uh, um, several different uh, data sets on which to validate and test uh, your score. Uh, with one of the reasons that polygenic risk scores are increasingly uh, shown to be powerful is because we've got this amazing resource in the UK called the UK Biobank. So there's uh, many, many years of work when it is compiling a whole load of summary statistics on coronary artery disease. Uh, so we have a very, very well powered GWAS on, on CAD. And now we can use those summary statistics that are based on tens, if not hundreds of thousands of individuals um, on a brand new data set, the UK Biobank, which is an enormous data set where we have people with CAD and without CAD. And we also have genetic information and other phenotypic information about those same individuals. And so we can, we can begin to start building polygenic risk scores, validating them and testing them on, on, um, uh, on the UK Biobank. So, uh, it's interesting to note that last time I checked on what's called the, the PGS catalog, which is an online open repository of polygenic risk scores, there are at least 15 different scores for CAD. So there are various different ways in which you can, uh, which you can build polygenic risk scores, as I said at the beginning, and different scores uh, behave in different ways. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, uh, one paper that was, you know, is, is, is quite a famous paper in, in, in the field, and that was this one from about three years ago by Amit Kira and colleagues, where they showed really for the first time that, that, um, that, that, that a, a polygenic risk score for CAD uh, can, can, show, can find individuals at equivalent risk to a disease called familial hypocholesterolemia. Now, familial hypocholesterolemia, or FH, is, is a disease that where an individual has a very, very high level of LDL. And we know that LDL levels are, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a cause, uh, cause uh, heart disease and CAD. So uh, what these authors did was to uh, produce a distribution of scores, just like the one I just showed you on of polygenic risk scores on uh, on the UK Biobank. And because they have data about who was a case and who was a control, they could show that individuals in the tail of the distribution, the right-hand tail of the distribution, had a much much more increased risk of CAD than the rest of the, the, the population. So here you can see they've cut off uh, various different thresholds at which individuals have threefold increased risk. So that's the top 8% of the po uh, of the polygenic risk or distribution, have a three times increased risk of CAD compared to everyone else. 
And then 2.3%, the 2.3% of individuals at the very top of the, of the, of, of the right-hand end of the, the PRS distribution have a fourfold increase. And then half a percent of, the, of that PRS uh, distribution have uh, uh, 0.5%, uh, have a five-fold increased risk of CAD. So you're really, trying, you're really finding populations of individuals who've got large, uh, you know, very much increased risk. This is shown in the middle where you know you can see that cases on average tend to have higher polygenic risk scores than controls and uh, we see that prevalence plot that I just showed you just a few minutes ago where individuals uh, in the highest uh, percentiles of the polygenic risk score belong to groups of individuals where the prevalence of CAD is very high. So familial hypercholesteremia was the way that I uh, started talking about this that's caused by a monogenic a set of monogenic mutations that increases your risk of CAD by about uh, three times. Uh, and so what, what, we, what we were able to see with this particular analysis is that polygenic risk score was a, a, were able to identify people at equivalent risk to those with familial hypercholesterolemia, threefold increased risk compared to the rest of the population. But familial hypercholesterolemia is actually, the mutations that cause that are very rare in the population, and about 0.4% of the population have, uh, can be identified through those mutations at being threefold increased risk, whereas polygenic risk scores can identify almost 20 times more people, 8% of the population at threefold increased risk. So that is, that, that, that's, a, that's a, I think, a really powerful example of how polygenic risk scores can identify populations of individuals who are at high risk who might not be able to be uh, identified in other ways. Um, if we now carry on uh, looking at CAD and monogenic variation in, in particular, you can see here on, by, on, on this odds ratio plot um, where, uh, we, where um, individuals are now split into three groups uh, based on their polygenic risk score, whether they've got a high score, which is the top quintile of the distribution, an intermediate score, which is the middle three quintiles of the distribution, or the, the lowest score, which is the bottom quintile of the distribution. And then if you look at uh, uh, carriers of an FH variant compared to non-carriers of an FH variant, you can see that individuals who carry FH variants are going to have higher risk. And that's what these, uh, these, these positive odds ratios mean. So if you're a carrier of uh, an FH mutation and you've got high polygenic risk, you've got an almost 12 times increased risk of CAD. Uh, you can see as well from this plot that the numbers of individuals who are in that strata out of the total number of individuals is actually quite small. Um, um, so when you make plots like this and look at the stratification of polygenic, ri of polygenic risk scores in carriers versus non-carriers, for people who are carrying, so carrying hypercholesterol, familial hypercholesterolemia variants, you can see that on average their, their risk is higher, carriers in blue are higher than, uh, than black, but in both, uh, both in terms of an odds ratio and in terms of probability of disease uh, by age 75, polygenic risk scores can modulate the penetrance of these, these mutations. So individuals can have a very low polygenic risk score and carry a variant and be right down the end uh, 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 of that blue distribution, having a, uh, you know, uh, having an, a, uh, a maybe 20% in the very lowest percentiles at 20% lifetime risk, um, which is kind of equivalent to somebody who is a non-carrier who's got very high polygenic risk score. So what we're seeing is that the polygenic risk scores can really help identify and stratify risk uh, uh, in carriers of, of monogenic variants. So it's sort of not enough to know whether or not you're carrying a monogenic variant. You need to know the polygenic risk score as well, because that will help you understand whether or not your risk is sky high or is it's a, a lot lower. Um, and in lots of ways, polygenic risk scores capture, at least in CAD, risk that is not caught by other clinical risk factors. So this was an interesting study where uh, polygenic risk scores were included in, in addition to um, other well-known risk factors for, uh, for, for CAD. And we can see that uh, the PRS, which is called MetaGRS in this plot, has a higher C index, which is a, is a measurement of predict, predictive power. And we can see that the MetaGRS has uh, you know, is, is, is a better, it has a better predictive power than any of these other clinical risk factors on their own, but combining them all together produces a model that has the best predictive power. So integrating polygenic risk scores and clinical risk can provide uh, models that have, uh, that, that have 
greater predictive power and finding those individuals at very high risk. Um, and uh, another interesting uh, avenue of research and another interesting way I think about polygenic risk scores is to look at how individuals in different parts of the polygenic risk score distribution, how their risk changes over their, over their life. And so we, those plots I was showing before show that individuals with very high uh, polygenic risk scores, uh, polygenic risk scores for CAD have a, uh, a, an increased risk of disease. But if you look at their lifetime risk, how that risk, uh, uh, how their risk trajectory changes over life, you can see that they their, their rich their their risk increases more quickly over time. Um, and uh, and um, and when you additionally add uh, polygenic risk scores into uh, clinical risk models, so on the right here, I'm showing uh, data from a paper by Hindi and colleagues, where they um, show individuals you use it, 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 they show individuals who, who occur in different parts of uh, a, a risk threshold um, uh, via a, a risk assessment called the pooled pool cohort equation. So the pool co co cohort equation takes into account a bunch of different clinical risk factors and assesses whether or not you have, based on those risk factors, low, borderline, intermediate, or high risk of, of a 10 year risk of disease. Um, you can further stratify individuals within those risk buckets by their polygenic risk score and show that individuals in the high bucket, for example, who have got high polygenic risk score as well, have an almost three times increased risk compared to individuals in that same pool cohort equation risk uh, category who have a low polygenic risk score. So, you, so this is really about stratifying risk and it's really about understanding how to use genetic inf information to, to, to personalize risk assessments. I'm going to briefly talk about some work that we did uh, at Atletica, and that was purely looking at, at LDL cholesterol and coronary artery disease. So in the same way uh, as um, Kira and colleagues uh, split the polygenic risk score distribution into groups, low polygenic risk score, intermediate polygenic risk score, and high polygenic risk score, we did the same. And then we uh, looked to see what the effect of different LDL levels in each of those strata had. And if you look at the low PR, PRS strata, individuals in that strata kind of had an average risk irrespective, um, and it's a low risk, a, a kind of population average risk, irrespective of what their LDL levels are. Whereas people who, with intermediate PRS or high PRS have increasingly high risk based on their LDL levels. So we know that high LDL levels increase your risk. But the interesting thing about this is that individuals who've got high PRS, so that remember they're people in the top quintile of the distribution, uh, their risk, uh, their, their, their CAD risk increases at a much quicker rate for with an increase in LDL than in, in people in the intermediate risk bracket. So, for example, people with high PRS who are in the, uh, who have an LDL cholesterol level of between 130 and 160, which might be considered, uh, if not safe, then not unsafe, uh, actually have equivalent risk over, over a, a lifetime risk. Of, of CAD compared to people in the intermediate group who've got very high LDL cholesterol levels. So it's, it, it's sort of not okay to say that there's, a set, there's one single safe value of LDL cholesterol. The safe value of LDL cholesterol very much depends on what your underlying polygenic risk for disease is. And as I say, this was, this was work we published um, earlier on this year. Uh, I'm now gonna talk about uh, breast cancer and polygenic risk scores. So breast cancer, one of the most common cancers that affects people, um, uh, women in, in the, developing, the developed world. Um, and we have now got various polygenic risk scores that uh, equivalently stratify risk uh, uh, um, in, in, in women. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about a bit about how, uh, how we can use polygenic risk scores to identify um, or to show that in, in equivalently, there is no one safe level of LDL. There's sort of no one safe age at which to check a woman's uh, whether or to start screening because screening a women for women for breast cancer because the threshold, which I'm showing on the right here, is this red line, um, is the is is the threshold threshold at which the average population approaches a uh, about three percent. Uh, 10 year risk of disease. 
and screening programs, national screening programs are based on, 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 on an understanding that when women get to that, that, that level of risk, um, they should start getting screened for breast cancer. And as you can see, that threshold um, hits the blue line at about age 50, which is often when uh, national screening programs start. But women who have got very, very high polygenic risk scores, so the top, the top percentile of the distribution there, a woman in that, in that orange line will approach that same risk much, much earlier on in life. So she's gonna have the risk at which we think as a society, it's appropriate to start screening women at age 50, because age is such a big risk factor. But, but, because of that, but because of her polygenic risk, she's gonna approach that risk much earlier on in life. So there is no one safe age uh, uh, to start screening because your polygenic risk will dictate to a certain extent um, how your risk uh, uh, trajectory uh, for breast cancer is gonna change over life. Um, and equivalently to, to CAD, uh, uh, we all know about monogenic variation and, and breast cancer with the BRCA mutations, but you know the BRCA mutations are not, as I said right at the beginning, are not 100% penetrant. You know, people can have BRCA mutations and not get breast cancer. Um, and actually, what we're starting to understand is that polygenic risk can can modulate the penetrance of these of these breast can breast cancer variants. So if an individual, if a woman's average, if the average risk of a woman who's carrying a BRCA gene is about one in three, 35% of getting breast cancer by the age of 75, if you then add additionally polygenic information, you can identify women who have got much, much greater risk, more than a one in two, even up to a sort of eight, almost 80% chance of risk if you use those two pieces of information. And equally, there are women down the other end of the di distribution who are less likely to get, um, who have, who've got a, a lower than one in three chance of getting breast cancer. So what we're beginning to understand and, and, and can show now with various different diseases is that uh, both monogenic variation and polygenic variation can combine to provide better stratification of risk. And it's not just in the BRCA genes, incidentally. So the BRCA genes are very highly pe penetrant. Um, but in other less penetrant genes like PALB2 and CHECK2, we see a similar story where women who carry these, these, uh, uh, these variants and who have polygenic risk scores have a, a much increased uh, risk trajectory over the, the period of their life. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and even women who've got a family history can be further stratified by uh, polygenic risk. So uh, these, these plots on the right show the, how you can combine polygenic risk with family history and show that women who've got a family history of disease and who aren't in the top of the polygenic risk score distribution have a lower lifetime risk and a slower risk trajectory compared to women at the very top of the PRS distribution who have family, family history of disease. Um, so I've, I've spoken a lot about monogenic variants and um, the these two studies came out earlier on this year, and they showed that, of course, there are various monogenic variants that uh, that, that cause women uh, to have a much higher, you know, if they carry them to have a much higher risk of breast cancer. But actually, um, they're very rare at a population level. So only and even at a uh, even at a even at a disease level. So only about five percent of of of, of uh, breast cancer cases. Are the result of mutations in these 12 main breast cancer genes. That means that 95% of breast cancer is not because of monogenic variants, yet we have ways in which we, uh, at least clinically, can test for monogenic variation. So, um, uh, you know, at, at a population level, the, the, these, are very, these, these, are, these are penetrant, but they're rare. So we need to find new ways of identifying people who are at genetic risk of disease, and I think polygenic risk scores are, are one way we can do that. So I'm just going to run through a few benefits of polygenic risk scores just to kind of uh, uh, finish off. So um, polygenic risk scores can help explain the basis of disease where no other risk factors are present. So what do I mean by that? So here I'm showing two plots from a, a recent paper that looked at five different diseases and um, tried to identify uh, ways in which disease could be uh, identified in, in each of these five diseases split into early onset disease and late onset disease. And 
what they what these what, what these authors did was to uh, identify cases of a disease and then assess whether or not clinical risk factors would have identified the, these individuals as being at high risk, whether polygenic risk scores would have identified them as being at high risk, or whether you know whether they were individuals who had both high polygenic risk and high clinical risk, and whether that could explain the, the, the disease. And what we see on the left is that for uh, lots of if for all five diseases um, uh, that that red part of the uh, of of the bar is 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 the largest apart from apart from uh, coronary heart heart disease what does that mean it means that those those bits of the bar those red bits of the bar represent people who uh, who could only be identified as being high risk through their through polygenic risk scores so polygenic risk scores can identify uh, the basis of disease. They can identify disease when clinical risk factors would not have, have, have shown any, any, any disease. It's, it's uh, uh, clinical risk factors come into play with late onset disease. Uh, they're, they're a much greater component of that because you kind of accumulate risk over time and you, can, uh, uh, you accumulate uh, environmental exposure and risk over time. So these are the sorts of things that clinical risk factors can pick up. But nevertheless, there are still um, uh, 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 groups of individuals late on, with late onset of, of each of these diseases who would only be picked up through um, through through uh, a polygenic risk score. As I said uh, earlier on about breast cancer, um, age-based screening is based on a population risk, but we're now beginning to understand that we can identify people who've got very different personalized risk. And so maybe it's time to start thinking about how we can uh, uh, change the way we, we, we screen populations to ensure that we're uh, screening individuals who've got equivalent risk. Uh, uh, and that's not just based on age, it's based on other things as well, like polygenic risk. Um, uh, polygenic risk scores can also identify uh, populations at risk who are otherwise invisible. So adding polygenic risk scores can be used to, to traditional risk uh, assessment models, particularly for coronary artery disease, where we know that there are a bunch of different clinical risk factors that can really push up your risk. If you can add polygenic risk score as an additional risk enhancing factor, there's a clear way in which that can um, align with, with guidelines of, of dealing with, with high risk individuals. I'll talk a bit about guidelines and implementation of, 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 sc of scores in the clinic in a bit. Um, but, but really, what we're beginning to see is that, you know, there are, in particular for, for cardiovascular disease, there are already risk models that are used in the clinic to identify people at high risk, and those people at high risk are given therapeutics or, or, or asked to change their behavior to, to lose weight, to try and uh, lower their cholesterol. Um, if we can add, and we can add, polygenic risk scores into those same uh, risk assessment uh, paradigms, then I believe that there's a much quicker way in which we can utilize this, this information and, and identify people who might be uh, being pushed up into higher risk thresholds through their polygenic risk. Um, so an, another way of thinking about how we can uh, integrate polygenic risk into these current uh, risk assessment pro pro processes is by thinking about how well do we reclassify risk when we include polygenic risk scores into a risk assessment. And this recent paper showed that actually um, we can do a pretty good job of finding those people who were at uh, intermediate risk um, and, and push them up to a higher risk score, a uh, higher absolute risk score on the basis of adding in um, polygenic risk. So polygenic risk scores integrated into cardiovascular disease models can improve the general risk classification by about 10%. So that means that these risk models that currently being used that don't include any genetic information, uh, you can get a better, more precise uh, a, a classification of risk um, uh, by incorporating that polygenic risk score. Um, another really interesting uh, avenue for using polygenic risk scores is in therapeutics and, to and, and, it, uh, and here are a couple of quite old now um, studies that use polygenic risk scores that really contain very few variants. Um, but showed that individuals with different risk uh, in different parts of the risk distribution react differently to therapeutics 
and have a different absolute risk reduction based on their polygenic risk score. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that actually, if you understand what an individual's polygenic risk score is, you can understand how well they're going to respond to certain drugs. So, so not only can polygenic risk scores tell you something about uh, an individual's risk, but it can also start to hint at how well they might uh, respond to different therapeutics. Um, here on the right, uh, you can see uh, that, diff that individuals with different risk categories uh, get a diff differential risk reduction based on um, uh, based on the on on on, on uh, the drugs that they take. So individuals in the in the high polygenic risk uh, uh, category here on the right hand side uh, uh, in in the presence of this particular drug had a lower had a had a greater risk reduction than individuals in the intermediate and low um, uh, risk categories. So um, we're also beginning to understand, and actually, as we get better data and and and, and more uh, and more of these trials, we're showing that polygenic risk scores can also help us understand who might respond better to drugs. And the nice thing about polygenic risk scores is that they don't change over your life. So uh, in this kind of uh, review piece that came out last year they were described as the first risk factor for CAD. So all of these other risk factors that you build up and accumulate over life that contribute to your risk of CAD can all be measured. Um, but actually a polygenic risk score is, is, is almost the first risk factor. So it can be understood from birth and uh, you know, potentially used from an early age to understand the effect of these additional risk factors and, um, and, and even advise people onto you know, how much of effect their polygenic risk might have on their overall CAD risk over time. Uh, so to finish, I'm going to, I've, I've spoken a lot about the science uh, of what we do at Alelica and what um, uh, polygenic risk scores are. And I'm now I'm going to talk a bit more about the challenges that we find as a company of trying to, uh, of trying to do, of, of trying to integrate and implement polygenic risk scores in the clinic. In the clinic. So there are scientific challenges, and uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, somehow accounting for differential genetic ancestry. Uh, so we have ways of adjusting for ancestry, but ultimately, the, the most of the genetic, the, the genome-wide association studies, and most of the genetic data from prospective cohorts like the UK Biobank that we have are based on individuals of European ancestry. So if you want to ensure that polygenic risk scores are going to be available for um, uh, the broad broadest uh, uh, um, uh, range of society, then we're going to have to come up with ways of, of, of dealing with the fact that we have in the, that, that most of the data we have is based on European ancestry. So we have ways of doing that at the moment uh, in lieu of, of bigger and better and more ancestrally diverse uh, data sets in the future. But it, it is the case that polygenic risk scores at the moment um, are most predictive in populations of European ancestry. That doesn't mean they're not predictive in populations of non-European ancestry. So as an example with CAD, we might be able to identify 20% of the population who've got a threefold increased risk of CAD, um, you know, because they're in the top of the distribution. If you look to individuals with African ancestry, you could still identify a, a proportion of individuals with threefold increased risk but that might be around about 8%. So it's a smaller proportion of the population who are equivalently at high risk. Now, actually, the prevalence of coronary artery disease in African populations is slightly higher than in European ancestry groups anyway. So if, you, if you're identifying people who've got threefold increased risk compared to the rest of the population, when the rest of the population has a high risk anyway, there's still clear utility in, our, in my mind about using polygenic risk scores in these groups. Nevertheless, we still need to think and we are very actively trying to work out ways in which we can account for ancestry. Uh, with any uh, clinical product, we need to uh, show and evidence the clinical validity and utility of, 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 of a polygenic risk score. So that's about uh, rep replicability. It's about showing that the same individual will get the same score over and over again, no matter what sequencing technology you use. Um, and we're working very hard to try and build that evidence base and to 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 to, um, to show that there is uh, you know great promise in these in these tools, um, and to to further show that they they have utility in um, uh, in the general population.
And uh, you know, uh, an equally large part of, of, of what we try to do is to try and think about how we communicate what we're doing, and, and that's about clinical reporting. So what do we do with the polygenic risk score when we, when we, um, when we produce one? Uh, so I'll just talk quickly about clinical reporting, but there are other scientific challenges. Here you've seen the, the classic risk distribution, the, the, the bell curve that I've shown you before. And um, you know, how do you communicate to an individual that they are at an increased risk compared to the rest of the population? Well, you can try and say, well, look, you're in the tail of the distribution. You've got a relative, you, relative increased risk. Um, what we try to do is to say, look, how much increase is your risk compared to the rest of the population? So you can see this individual might be in the top of the distribution there, but if you look at where their percentile of the polygenic risk score uh, allows them to fall, it shows that they have a, you know, an increased risk compared to the remainder of the population. Um, uh, another way is, as I was talking about with CAD, is to try and integrate this information into risk models that are already used. So here is a, uh, a kind of visualization of, an, uh, of a woman who has uh, a massively increased, uh, well, a greatly increased risk above a threshold of breast cancer based on uh, in, uh, integrating uh, polygenic risk score with a, a, a standard risk model called the Gale model. And what we can see is that uh, this, 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 this woman has a, a, a much increased risk and it's above the threshold at which uh, we begin to worry. So, um, so thinking about ways of reporting uh, and trying to get this information in, in a clinically relevant way is something we're very active in. And uh, another another example of this is is this this cartoon that we've made about our LDL and PRS results, where we we're showing how an individual's how the combination of an individual's LDL and their polygenic risk combine to to uh, to, um, to provide a, an overall assessment of risk. So this individual um, has a high polygenic risk score and what might be considered a, a safe level. Of LDL, and actually that comes that combines to 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 be a to be a clinically uh, relevant high high risk. So, um, you know, we're working on ways to, to to really try and feed all this information into the clinic. There are huge technical challenges with a lot of what we do. So, integrating electronic health record data, which can provide uh, programmatically a lot of the information that, that can feed into these integrated risk models and can be used to train them, is a challenge ensuring that everything that we do is compliant with privacy um, is, 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 another, uh, is another challenge, but one that we're very happy to rise to. And also deploying this kind of software at scale uh, is, is again, something that we've worked very hard to do. Um, and there are also practical challenges. So one of them is who pays for, you know, if you, if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, deploy polygenic risk scores at scale, somebody's going to have to pay for that. So how do you make a, a, an argument that this is a good investment? So we are working on health economic analyses that try to really uh, quantify the effect and the benefit of, of, of uh, deploying polygenic risk scores at scale. There's also a lot of regulatory and, and compliance uh, to, to think about. So how do we ensure that the, the, the technology that we use and the, the tests that we produce are um, fit for purpose. And uh, you know, another, another big part of what we do is to, to, to try and align our, our, our products with, with the latest and uh, regulatory and, and, and compliance uh, frameworks. We as a team work internationally, both internally. So we're spread across three or at least three different offices in, uh, and we've got workers in about six different countries. But we, we also need to work internationally in different countries with different health systems, each of which has got slightly different ways of working. And that's a challenge. You know, you can't just do one thing in America that is going to work in the UK or in Europe. You know, you have to you have to um, uh, you have to be flexible. And uh, as I hope you you know, hope I'm getting across, it, it's sort of important to try and align what we do with current guidelines and current clinical practice so that we can really try to show the benefit in a way that doesn't seem too uh, different from the way that people are doing things now, but just feels more precise and more personalized. And of course, there are many other challenges, but um, with that, I'm going to finish and hopefully there's some time for some questions. Great, thank you so much.
Um, we have had a few questions and um, we got a few throughout the talk, which I think you answered at the end in your challenges section. So I hope people who submitted those were happy with um, the answers. But one question we just got was, um, how are the cutoffs for risk thresholds actually decided between high and intermediate risk, say? In terms of, so, so I mean, that's, that's the nice thing about the coronary artery or the cardiovascular disease thresholds is that they are actually defined by the American Heart Association in the case in America. So the American Heart Association publish these guidelines every year and they say, if you are at a what's called a borderline risk, which is between a five and 7.5% 10 year risk of, uh, of disease, then you should really try to modify your lifestyle to reduce your LDL levels or whatever. If you're in this 7.5 to 20% bracket, then it, you, know, you should really try to reduce your LDL. And if you can't do that after three months, they recommend statins. And then there are various other risk factors that come into play to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to suggest various therapeutic interventions. So, so, and that's all based on this 10 year risk, right? So uh, what we're trying to do and what we do do is to say, look, we can identify your 10 year risk by incorporating both clinical risk and poly polygenic risk scores. And given that you already have a, uh, a set of guidelines for people at these, in these different risk thresholds, then surely you can use this information in exactly the same way to, uh, uh, and we can show it's more precise um, to align with the guidelines and to align with therapeutic and, and behavioral change. Mm, of course, That's great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, how can we address the missing heritability issue in GWAS, which presumably weakens the strength of polygenic risk scores? Yes, so I mean, it does weaken the strength of them, but uh, you know, various. Of, so there, I think there are two answers to that. One is, um, you know, tr trying to think about ways in which you identify potentially causal variants rather than associated variants. So, um, you know, there may well be uh, a bunch of different variants that you've got in your polygenic risk score that are, you know, associated uh, but are not causal. So the heritability of those particular variants is going to be a bit lower, but there, so, so, so there's a process called fine mapping, which is to say, can we use summary statistics and external data to try and identify causal variation rather than um, uh, associated variation? And that's something that we've, we've got a research project on at the moment, actually. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a good question. And I think that, you know, my kind of my, my cop out answer is to say, yes, we could get better association statistics, we could access some, some of this heritability, but even at the moment, for some diseases, these scores are pretty predictive. So all that's going to do is make them more predictive. So, um, uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what steps do you think need to be taken to introduce polygenic risk scores more commonly into clinical care, especially in the UK and other public health systems? Uh, so I think we need to do some pilot studies and there are in fact people who are doing pilot studies that are um, assessing. Um, so I think the science is pretty strong for some diseases. And I think, I, I think it's really important to think about polygenic risk scores not as being uh, you know, a kind of blanket uh, uh, tool, but, uh, but you know, they, they have specific and better utility in certain diseases at the moment. So I think that what we need to try and do is to, in those diseases where they have got validity and utility and, and potential and the evidence is there that they are predictive, we need to start using them in the clinic. And we also need to understand a bit more or a lot more about how people react to this information, you know, because if you're potentially identifying a much, much larger part of the population who are you know, have a greater genetic liability uh, for risk, then you need to try and understand what that, you know, how to communicate that sort of information, how to ensure that people don't get freaked out by that information and, and are ultimately empowered to do something about it. And I think with cardiovascular disease, you're kind of, you know, there are, there are ways in which you can use uh, different levers, you know, can, uh, you know, modifiable risk factors to kind of reduce that risk. In other diseases where, like breast cancer, where there are, there are like fewer uh, modifiable risk factors that you can really try and tweak to, to reduce that risk, you know, it's about trying to uh, 
uh, identify those people at high risk and then say, right, you should just, you know, you should be screened more often. You should think about, um, you know, starting mammographic screening earlier, et cetera. Um, so, so um, uh, and then there's obviously this, this, this health economic thing, you know, this cost, because in the short term, you know, uh, we don't need to sequence a genome. You can sequence somebody on a chip, but that's still a cost, right? So who's going to pay for that cost? And um, so we need to, we need to, and we are trying to uh, argue that there is, uh, you know, there's going to be a bit of a short term uh, increase in costs, but over the lifetime of, of an individual, that cost is easily going to outweigh what you'd save uh, through, um, you know, lower therapeutic costs and, and um, you know, uh, people not having to access, uh, you, you know, not having emergency events and things like that. Mm, yeah, of course. And we actually had another question somebody asked on how can we make people understand these things. So I think that answers that quite nicely as well. But it's, a, um, it's, a, you know, it's a real challenge because I think I think it's it's kind of easy. It, it's sort of easier for for people to think about there being single mutations that might cause a disease because it's kind of how you learn about genetics at school. Mm, yeah. This idea that a whole bunch of common variants, each of which has a little effect, you know, combine to produce, you know, high risk in some people and, you know, average. Risk. I think it, it, it requires a bit of a different, it's a communication challenge because it's, it's you, you know, it's not how we've been taught how genetics works to a certain extent, but actually it, it is with certain diseases that, yeah. that's how it's playing out. So uh, there does need to be a bit of an educational and a communication challenge to that as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. And especially with relative risk versus absolute risk where the media likes to report the scarier number. <laughs> yeah. And it's probabilistic as well. And I mean, you know, it, it, communicating probabilities anyway is, 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 is tricky. Um, yeah, absolutely. And again, leading on from what you just said, somebody's asked, um, are there any diseases which polygenic risk scores aren't currently really used for, but you think will be in the future? Yeah, I didn't talk about prostate cancer, but prostate cancer, the polygenic risk score for prostate cancer is, is amazingly predictive. Um, there, so we built a polygenic risk score for Alzheimer's disease, which is also very predictive. The problem with that one is that you can't really do a lot if you know you're gonna, so, so at the moment you can't really do a lot if you know you're at high risk of Alzheimer's because there's no you know treatment I mean it might help identify people who would be more um uh, uh you know who would be more suited to clinical trials and things um so so um yeah so so prostate cancer is one answer Alzheimer's yeah as I say we've got we've got quite a predictive one for Alzheimer's but it's there's a lot of baggage with that because you know how do you do you need to tell somebody that they're at risk of a high risk of a disease where there's not really anything you can do about it? Mm. Um, uh, uh, type two diabetes, we've got a pretty predictive score for actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd say, yeah, prostate cancer, breast cancer, CAD, um, and then type two diabetes. Um, but yeah, they're the ones that I think, they're the ones where the evidence and the interesting thing about the evidence is, and I didn't really highlight this, but it's 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 compelling, which is that you know with breast cancer, for example, we see the same results about you know stratification of risk in the UK biobank, and then in other data sets like the Finnish biobank, and you know so there are multiple data sets, multiple different analyses that are all pointing in the same direction. So it's not just like a one-off thing. Um, so. Uh, um, so yeah, I think um, uh, you know, I think I think the evidence, I think the evidence is there, and and the challenge is going to be trying to get people on board. Of course, yeah, uh, we've got a couple more, but since it's six now, I think we just got finished from one question where somebody said, "What are the next steps for Lelica?" <sighs> so we yeah, we've got we've got various different um, uh, pilot projects in 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 process in in the process where we're really trying to understand you know, more of what those challenges are to getting uh, things used. We are working with some very progressive health systems in America that are trying to deploy these, uh, deploy these tests at, at scale and in a way that we hope can be, you know, can show that show, further show evidence of their utility. Um, and, and we're also working with, with people in uh, Europe and, uh, uh, and we're beginning to work with people in the UK to, to try and, you know, to just to try and continue to build this evidence base. Because as I say, a lot of what I spoke about today was the science. I think the science for loads of diseases or increasing number of diseases is getting very strong. 
what we're really trying to do now is to kind of start um, really trying to get people to use them and uh, and to show their benefit. So so that's what our that's what our real intense sort of focus is for the next mm -hmm. you know, six months to a year. That's well, but we're very excited to see what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great. So thank you everyone so much for coming and thank you George for that talk. It was really interesting. And just a reminder that we've recorded the talk and it should be up on the Centre for Personalised Medicine YouTube channel at some point soon. So keep an eye out for that if anything's caught your fancy and you'd like to rewatch. And yeah, have a good evening everyone. Great. Thanks very much.